A lot of people waste time. We talk about this in our course, how to create 20, 30, 40 hours more a week. But the first thing is, it's like, it's, it's this, it's this low hanging fruit. You know, so I find people are like, oh, I don't have any time to do things. These are the same people with all the social media apps on their phone. Mm -hmm. These are the same people that, you know, spend 10 or 20 hours a week. They're like, oh, did you see the football game this weekend? It's like, hey, if, if you don't have the money and the wealth in your life that you want, maybe you should cut out ESPN or Fox News or CNN or whatever it is you're watching. Yeah. Welcome to the Dr. Ashley Show. Welcome to the Dr. Ashley Show. I'm Dr. Ashley, and today I've got a guest I'm so excited about. His name is Chris Larson, and he's a great friend, a great person, and a great investor. He's actually the founder and principal of Next Level Income, and he bought his first property, rental property, when he was still in college, 21 years old. We went to the same college, Virginia Tech, actually. <laughs> Um, and now he is actively involved in over $1 billion of real estate acquisitions. And he's here to help us find empowerment in our investing. So, Chris, thank you so much for being here. Yeah, happy to be here, Ashley. Yeah. Good to see you. Yeah, good to see you, too. Thanks yeah. for coming all the way. Absolutely. <laughs> so most of the listeners might be thinking, hey, this is Dr. Ashley Wellness. It's a show about wellness and fat loss and fitness metabolism, longevity. Why is she here talking to someone about finances and investments and wealth? So I'd love to get your perspective on that. I have mine, of course, which is why I invited you here. But why don't you share from your perspective what the two have to do with each other? Yeah, I think it's a great question. And actually, my coaching clients, we have four different categories of goals that we work with. And the top one is actually health, not wealth. Seriously. Absolutely. And I think, I think they flow into, into one another in a big way. Money can help you buy your time back. Mm -hmm. It can help you buy better food. It can help you buy, you know, better care, you know, as, as your patients are aware of. Mm -hmm. And, you know, all those things really combine to make you more healthy, to allow you to live a better life. And my mission with Next Level Income is to help individuals achieve financial independence through education as well as investment opportunities. And a piece of that education isn't just like how to make more money, how to have more money, but how to actually enjoy your money and really get more out of life. And that's where health comes as well, because we all know if you don't have health, it really doesn't matter how much money you have either. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, I was thinking about this, and I think that if you don't have good finances, you don't have good investments, yep. then it adds another layer of stress to yourself, to your life. And I just did an episode on the impact of stress and health and so if you can get your investments in order, your finances in order, it will help to reduce that level of stress and then have positive impact on your health. And then I think also if you've got great health, but you don't have the wealth that you need to be able to really enjoy life to its fullest, then that can suffer too. Have you read this book called Die With Zero by Bill Perkins? Yeah, I love it. I've really? been talking about it yeah, a lot in the past year or so. Uh -huh. um, a good friend of mine recommended it to me mm -hmm. because... I was, I was kind of like working through some stuff with my business and we actually used to be business partners. And I mentioned to him, I, I was talking to him, he said, you should read this book, Die With Zero. Yeah. Guy's a, a former, um, I don't know if he was a billionaire, but he ran a billion, like, mm -hmm. you know, billions in, in terms of trading and hedge funds. And yeah, it's a really interesting perspective. And, you know, it's one of those things. I, I, I look at it in terms of, you know, money and how money is is a um, means to an end. Mm -hmm. And also, you know, if you think about, you know, if you have good health and you can live instead of 80 to 100 or 120, well, why would you retire at 59 or 65 or 70 years old? Mm -hmm. Like, what are you going to do with, yeah, with the know. next 50 years? Yeah, it's mm -hmm. more, you know, purpose. I think, you know, that was zero is cool because it talks about kind of enjoying your wealth mm -hmm. along the way. Um, yeah. So I'm a big fan of that book. Yeah, he talks about your lifetime fulfillment score as well, right? And he says that you need to have your health, number one, um, because if you don't have your health, then you can't enjoy your money and your time. Yeah. And he says those are the three primary fact factors, health, uh, money, and time. And you need to have all three of those. Even though if we don't have wealth, we still can enjoy fun things in life. I understand that, but it just makes the process easier. Yeah, and... I think uh, Dan Sullivan, strategic coach, mm -hmm. has a saying. He says, if you can write a check for it, it's not a problem. So when it comes to your health, if you can write a check to you know, have better food, if you can write a check for you know, better medical care, you know, whether it's, I mean, think about it, whether it's for you know, your children you know, to give them a better environment in school, whether it's for your children for better health care, whether it's for you if you have 
you know, health emergency. Um, you know, my, my son had his appendix out earlier this year That's right. and it, we have a big deductible, but it wasn't a problem to make that payment. Mm-hmm. And we know when you can have that care for your kids, it's, it's a peace of mind. And like you said, with, with money, without money, there's stress mm-hmm. and it, it goes both ways. I'd rather have the stress that comes with money mm-hmm. than without money. And that was one of my drivers as well as I was in college and I was reading, you read the statistic where you know, the, the biggest thing that comes between couples is money, mm-hmm. you know, money arguments. And if, if you can eliminate that, that allows you more time to focus on, like you said, things that are more important and relationships are huge, mm-hmm. right? When it comes to our happiness yeah, in life. Yeah, the biggest, I think. Yeah. Have you heard the song, Buy Me a Boat by Chris Jansen? I don't know that song. Do you listen to country music? Uh, actually, I was at a CrossFit this morning. They were playing country, but that's about the only time I listen to it is when I'm, yeah, when I'm at, you know, uh, <laughs> No, involuntarily exposed to it. I'm just kidding. But. Country music is yeah. it's great. I have to listen. Yeah, yeah. I'm not. I'm not saying it's not. Yeah. It's not much. Yeah, all the more, I'm more '90s is- rap. You know, when it comes to stuff. Yeah. You didn't strike me as a country man, and so now, I'm gonna. What about the beard? That helps I don't a little know, bit, right? No. So I'm gonna send you this song. I'm gonna text it to you after. Yeah. And um, I don't sing, but I wrote down the chorus. All right. And I'm just going to read it to you. I can sing it. Okay. So he goes. I know everybody says money can't buy happiness, but it could buy me a boat. It could buy me a truck to pull it. It could buy me a Yeti 110 ice down with some silver bullets. Yeah, I know what they say. Money can't buy everything. Well, maybe so, but it could buy me a boat. Yeah. Is that great? I like that. So I was hoping that today you can teach us how to buy ourselves a boat. (laughs) Teach us what we need to do to invest so that we can do that. And one of those like crazy expensive wake surfing boats. Okay. I love those. Okay. Yeah. I like so, the wake surf. So where yeah. do we go? Where do we go from there? Yeah. So I think we need to back up a little bit because we're talking about things that are like, you know, extravagant essentially, mm-hmm. like, like a, a luxury boat, yeah. um, even luxury cars. You know, when you think about it, it's like, well, why, why and when should you spend money mm-hmm. on things like that? And so if we can back up, we can mm-hmm. talk about the next level income strategy and philosophy. Sure. Um, And by the way, if you are, if you're listening today or watching today, you can get a copy of the book. I talk about the strategy. I talk about more about my background, Um, nextlevelincome.com. You can get a free copy, but it's make, keep, and grow your money. Mm -hmm. So number one is you need to make more money. When I was in college, I read Rich Dad, Poor Dad, and Robert Kiyosaki talked about becoming accredited. An accredited investor makes $200,000 or more in, in a year as an individual or 300,000 as a couple, Mm -hmm. or a million dollar net worth, either as an individual or a couple not including your primary residence. Robert Kiyosaki talked about how if you're an accredited investor, you have access to investments that non-accredited investors don't have. The other piece that you realize and talk about is if you're accredited, you have more money, you have more capital to invest. So when we talk about money, we talk about investing, number one is make more money. If you're not accredited, I believe that you should go out and either find a way in your career or business or, or start a business to add and create more income to do that. Um, once we do that, then we talk about how to keep more money. Mm-hmm. Okay. So then, you know, this new course that you've ha- you've got, it's called yeah. Six Figures of Passive Income. I mean, how does this help us? Does this help us get to the accredited point or does it help us go from the accredited pr- point forward? Yeah. Great question, Ashley. So uh, the course, we talk about, you know, ways that you can make more money and that could be, you know, just ways to increase your time, your effectiveness mm-hmm. in your business. It can talk about, way, you know, other options to start a business. It could talk about active ways to invest in real estate, which is which is a business, essentially. We talk about ways to keep more money. So there's there's three things that are very insidious that can, that can kind of take your wealth and erode your wealth. You know, one is a major life or health incident. Mm-hmm. So you need to be well insured against that. Um, the next thing is, is going to be, uh, like frivolous lawsuits or people, you know, any lawsuit really. So do you have the right legal structures? So do you have the right, um, insurance structures? Do you have the right legal structures? And then the other one that we all know about is taxes. Mm -hmm. You know, if I can say, Hey, I can save you money on your taxes. I can save, if you're paying a 50% incremental tax rate, when you add up state, federal, as well as all the other taxes we pay on a day-to-day basis, sales tax, property tax, all these things. If you're in California, if you're in a highest tax state, you may be paying 60% or more of your your income in taxes, right? So I feel like you're always better off in figuring out how to make more money and then saving money in taxes and protecting your wealth before you go on to that investment part. Mm -hmm. So we talk about making money, keeping money, and then we attack the growth part. 
you know, which is the sexy part. It's, it's like, how do you invest? Like, what are you going to do to have your money work for you? Mm -hmm. But the first thing is, you know, how do you, how do you create, you know, that capital that you can invest? Our personal family goal is to save 50%. That's always been our, our personal goal. So when you're talking about buying a boat, that's great. So if you go and you're making enough money and you're like, Hey, I got this excess capital that I can spend, buy a boat, buy a car, take a trip, enjoy your wealth. I think that's important as, as they talk about mm -hmm. and die with zero, but having that discipline. So you have a plan to get to the point where you will have financial independence over a given period of time, I think is the, is the big picture. And that's what we really teach in the course as well. And so one of the top things from a dis discipline standpoint is to save 50% of what you bring in. I think that's a great benchmark. Mm -hmm. So let's say, let's say you are spending a hundred thousand dollars a year to support your family. So you have a family of four, you're spending a hundred thousand dollars a year and let's say you're making $200,000 or you're just mm -hmm. under that paying tax and you're spending pretty much everything, you know, that everything that you take home after tax. Well, if you can increase your earnings by $100,000 and you can decrease your tax rate or optimize your tax rate, you can save 100% of what you make on top of that that amount. Mm -hmm. So that's why I say, you know, start with make more money. A lot of people say, well, Chris, that's unrealistic for me to save 50%. And that's where you say, okay, how do you increase your earnings? Because I don't, I don't, I don't advocate to go out and say, hey, look, don't buy that $3 coffee. Don't, you know, don't take trips. Don't buy the boat. You know, life should be enjoyed. So mm -hmm. let's figure out how to enjoy it and how to do that. People like Dave Ramsey talk about, you know, saving money and doing things, but really Dave Ramsey's advice is is really for poor people. Why? Because so it, look, if you're not if you're if you're in the bottom 90% of this country, you know, and you're you're obligated to wait for the government to write you a check for social security or, you know, even if you put your money in a qualified plan, the government says what you can do with that money. Mm -hmm. You have to wait till 59 and a half before you get it out. And the fact of the matter is the government doesn't have enough money to pay the country's bills. So I believe that tax rates are going up. Mm -hmm. And if you have a significant amount of money in these plans, I believe that you're probably going to get taxed on those in the future. So that's why, you know, the more money you have, the better planning that you can do, the more you can put your money in tax advantage investments like real estate that we're big fans of or insurance. Those things I believe are going to be better protected against those tax rates and, and the government or their hands in the future. Mm -hmm. So then do you, is it, I bet it's very customized, just like nutrition for weight yeah. loss is customized, but are there three things you find you always suggest to people to start making more money? Or do you have to look at what they're doing currently, what type of job they're in, or are there things that like you could give our audience a, like three top tips? Yeah, that's a great question. So if you are a, if you're a professional and you bill by the hour, then I think you can figure out how do you create more billable hours. So my, my wife's an architect, you know my wife Jessica, yeah. and so she gets paid pretty well per hour, but she only has so many hours that she can work. Mm -hmm. So if she can spend less time doing lower value um, uh, tasks and she can sub that out to, to people, then she can, she can charge more on those higher tasks, the designing portion, for instance, mm -hmm. instead of um, like the documentation portion. So she actually has brought on somebody onto her team that she can hire out to do those things, which means she can spend more time doing things that are gonna be higher value. But this even goes to the household level. So let's say, um, so we have we have a friend, he has a landscape company, mm -hmm. and we hire him to come and do landscaping jobs around our property. People are like, well, why would you pay $50, Chris, to have somebody do that when you could do it yourself? Well, if you can bill 100 or $200 an hour, why not pay somebody $50 an hour if, if one for one, if that's four hours of your time a week, that's a significant difference. So number one is figure out how to optimize your time. A lot of people waste time. We talk about this in our course, how to create 20, 30, 40 hours more a week. I need that. Well, <laughs> we can talk about that for sure. Um, but the first thing is, it's like, it's, it's, this, it's this low hanging fruit. You know, so I find people are like, oh, I don't have any time to do things. These are the same people with all the social media apps on their phone. Mm -hmm. These are the same people that you know spend 10 or 20 hours a week. They're like, oh, did you see the football game this weekend? It's like, hey, if, if you don't have the money and the wealth in your life that you want, maybe you should cut out ESPN or Fox News or CNN or whatever it is you're watching. Yeah. So these are things that are, look, I did this myself You know, about 10 years ago. I realized I was staying up 
you know, instead of nine or nine thirty, I'd stay up till ten or ten thirty. Yeah. I watch some news show. Mm-hmm. I get all fired up, mm-hmm. you know, or I'd have a beer while I'm doing it. And it's like there was no benefit in terms of health or my time. Yeah. So I started getting up earlier. And that's the time I wrote my book. I wrote my book between five and seven o'clock in the morning because that was my quiet time. That was like my magic time. There's a lot of books out there and things out there that teach these things. Yeah. So number one is inventory your time, inventory your life, cut out things like social media, news, um, any, and, and look, this even goes to your relationships and it's hard sometimes, you know, there's people in your life that are, that are negative energy. Mm-hmm. So, and what I do is I don't say, Hey, cut those people out. I say, focus on the people that are bringing you what you want in your life. Mm-hmm. Make a list. I actually do like a little circle and I put all those people inside like my little inner circle and then spend more time with those people that are helping out. So that's a big thing, mm-hmm. um, for people, how to, how to, how to create more time in your life. So that's, that's one tip. I know that was kind of a little long-winded there. No, that's great. Delegate yeah. and elevate. I love it. Right. Delegate and elevate. That's a great way. You, yeah. you talked about Dan Sullivan, and I yeah. was listening to him, and he said that probably five years ago, I don't know, maybe a little bit longer than that, he cut out sports because he wow. used yep. to just watch it all the time and yep. would watch it on the weekend, and it can take up your whole weekend. My son yep. was asking to watch football yesterday. And I was like, well, you know, you can't watch five hours of screens in a day. So what are you going to do? And then we went and played pickleball instead. Yeah. I forgot about yeah. it. But yeah, that that can suck up so much time. It absolutely can. And look, it's not that you can't do the things that you enjoy. So I, I raced bicycles. I started 30 years ago. I raced on and off kind of for 20 years. I still like to watch cycling. But cycling, it's it's a lot of time. Like, so much time. Yeah, these races can be long. Like If, yeah. you're, if you watch the Tour de France, it can be hours. So I watch the highlights mm-hmm. and, you know, I'm a big fan of cold and hot therapy, yep. you know, sauna, cold plunges. So if I spend 30 minutes in my sauna, I can watch the highlights in 20 or 30 minutes mm-hmm. while I'm in the sauna, kind of at the end of the day as a reward to do that. So you can find a way to still enjoy the things that you're doing or become more efficient with those things. Mm-hmm. Um, I think there's a lot of ways to do that. Um, yeah. So once you create more time, it's like, but what do you do with that time? So what if you're in a job or a role where you can't just bill more hours, where you can't just work more? I was in sales, so there was usually ways for me to create more time. Mm -hmm. But what if you don't have that? What do you do? I would say look for a business that you can start or a side hustle that you can start on the side. I'll use my wife as an example again. She was working for somebody else as an architect and she started her business on the side Mm -hmm. to create more income. And our story was that after we had both our two boys, they went to daycare after paying taxes, paying for daycare, we took what what Jess made mm-hmm. and we subtracted that out. We lost eleven thousand dollars with her working that first no year. No way! Yeah, it was crazy. I right? bet that's so common. It's and it's it's unfortunate, right? Because yeah. we want professionals. In my opinion, we want high income earners. Yeah. In this in this um, country, really around the world, one to be productive, and two, we want to incentivize these people to have children, right? We want we want smart, productive people to have more kids, right? right? To to create, you know, that's how we create, you know, really demographics. And we can talk about how that relates to real estate, but demographics is the lifeblood of, of wealth in this country and developed nations around the world. So like these things are important and it's really hard when you look in the mirror in your own home, and you say, this doesn't actually make financial sense. And I looked at Jess and I said, do you want to stay home with the boys? And she's like, no, <laughs> like that is not what I want to do. I was yeah. To. Yeah. And look, you know, look, you're a professional, your husband's a professional. You know, we've we've all gone to school. She went to school longer than I did, and I have a master's degree. Yeah. I was like, no, I, no, you shouldn't be sitting at home. Like, you should be doing what you love, and mm-hmm. you should be going out and and creating and producing in, yeah. in the world. That's like that gives us value. Mm-hmm. So we we rearranged some things. We started building spec homes. Right. Started buying lots and building spec homes, and she started her own business. And then we we recreated kind of the way that she generated income. Mm-hmm. So once you figure out how to make more time in your life, you have to figure out if, if you need the capital, if you need the income, how do you take that time and turn it into income? And look, there is, you can drive for Uber. Yeah. You could buy a car and rent it on Turo. You could start an Airbnb. You could, I mean, there are so many opportunities to make money in the sharing economy and the world that we have. Mm-hmm. You could start a multi-level marketing business. You could start coaching. So I was racing. I had, I had a lot of time. I was on call and I was a rep. So I was in the hospital. I was on call. I had to sit there sometimes for hours on end at the hospital waiting, waiting for the, the staff or the surgeon to call me into the room. Mm-hmm. Well, if I'm sitting there for two hours in the cafeteria, I can write a training plan for somebody 
So I coached people in my spare time in between cases, even though I was making them laugh. <laughs> you know, so there's, I, and I did, you know, I learned, you know, learn about an investment strategy yeah. or that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Or look, if your health is number one, you know, so figure out what's your number one priority. You could, you could dedicate your time to do that. So if you're making a lot of money, but your health isn't where you want it to be, mm -hmm. you could spend your time doing that too. That's true. Yeah. So you talked about um, having someone come in and take the activities that you could let go of. You pay that person to take those activities so you can elevate yourself and do something that brings more cash in. Is there a certain equation that you can look at as to how much you should pay another person um, to then elevate yourself? Like, how do, is it worth $50 to pay someone to mow the lawn or is it just worth $25? How do you figure that? Well, if somebody charges you twenty five and somebody charges you fifty, it's worth it's worth twenty five dollars. <laughs> but um, so let's okay. So I think you know what I'm saying. I do no, know. I'm yeah, saying. your your question is, what when would you pay somebody versus do it yourself? Yes, right? and we're all at different levels of income. Yes. So understanding with what your level of income is, how much you should be spent paying someone else to do something for you. Yes, I I understand the question. Okay. I was just kind of making a little joke out of it. Oh. So um, so let's say you make a hundred thousand dollars a year. All right. Mm -hmm. You inventory your time. You say, how many hours do you actually work? So mm -hmm. let's say you work 40 hours a week. You make $100,000 a year. Um, the The way the equation works is uh, it's about $50 an hour. 40 hours a week, 50 hours worked, 2,000 hours yes. a year. 100,000 divided by 2,000, that's $50 an hour. Yes. Right? Mm -hmm. So it's pretty easy. You say, if, it's, if I can pay somebody less than 50 hours, or $50 per hour, then you should pay them to do that and go do your job or, okay. or what you do. However, it's even better than that. When I work with my coaching clients, here's what I find. The individuals are typically making about four times that number because you're not being productive with every hour that you work. So what you need to do is you, have, you should actually inventory the hours that you work and say, what are actually income generating activities? So I'll use the example of myself when I was a sales rep. I would, I would work with surgeons. I would work with the hospital. I would, I would work on educating the surgeons. I would work on negotiating with the hospital. I would be in surgeries. But I would also have to make sure the equipment was there and then the equipment was ready and sterile. Well, if I had to pick up a tray and transport it, right? Like let's say I have to go drive and pick something up and bring it to the hospital or I had to make sure, go through it and make sure all the pieces and parts were there. Um, what is what is that activity worth? It's probably worth like, you know, we're talking about 10 years ago. I'd say 10, 15 bucks an hour. I could probably pay a driver to drive somewhere, pick up something and bring it for 10 or 15 bucks an hour. Mm -hmm. Like it's not, that's not a high value activity. So if I inventoried my activities, I should be talking to surgeons. I should be in surgeries. I should be negotiating prices. Like these are the high value activities. Mm -hmm. And that's what my company will want to pay me to do. Like Jess, we use my wife as an example too. She should be designing plans. She shouldn't necessarily be, you know, pulling drawings and pulling things that is basic stuff that she can pay somebody, mm -hmm. you know, a quarter of what she charges. So if you look at your highest value activities and then say, hey, can I either hire somebody to do that or do I have somebody on my team or on my staff that can actually do that for me? If you're an individual, um, if you're, uh, you have your own business or you're an entrepreneur, a lot of people, the biggest thing that they can do is hire an assistant or implement some sort of technology. There's a lot of cool technologies out there. Like we use HubSpot for- um, Yeah, I've heard of HubSpot. Yeah, and it's it's it has AI built into it. There's a lot of things. It can automate the process. So when we're working with individuals, it, it can basically sift through the information and say, hey, you need to give uh, Dr. Ashley a call today or you need to send her this email or maybe it can even automate sending that. There's calendar options that are out there. You know, I'm obsessive with my calendar to make sure, yeah, oh, I'm a freak, yeah. Jess, Jess makes fun of me, she's like, oh, you even put on here like when you're gonna shower and when you're gonna eat. <laughs> I'm like, well, yeah, I need this, yeah, it takes time. It so I need to, take time. Yeah, it takes time. Mm -hmm. So, but if you, if again, that goes back to inventorying your time and becoming efficient with that. So I think that's very, that's very important. That's great advice. Yeah. Okay, so then why do you now invest in cash flow businesses like car washes, other things? Yeah. Can you share that with us? Yeah, so um, your question is like, why do I do it now? But uh -huh. I would, I started back when I was uh, in college. So we're That's talking right. about about 25 years uh -huh. ago, 24, 25 years ago. So I was in school. I was racing my bicycle. Mm -hmm. 
And that's, I, want, I was at Virginia Tech, as you know. That's right. And I just wanted to, I didn't want to be an engineer that I was studying to be. I wanted to be a professional cyclist. But in between my freshman and sophomore years of school, my best friend, my training partner, my roommate, Chris, passed away. So I go back to school. I race for another year. I'm at the highest amateur level. Mm -hmm. um, you can go pro at that point. And actually, my team did go pro, but I, I walked away from the sport. Part of the reason was I, I, was, I got burned out. You know, I missed my friend. I was depressed. But the other reason was there was I realized there was more to life than just riding my bike around in a circle. Mm -hmm. And it's, look, achievement in sports is, in athletics, is very important in my mind. You learn a lot through sports. Yeah. You learn discipline. You learn um, delayed gratification. You know, you learn teamwork. You learn, you learn all these things, right? It's, it's really great. But at some point, you have to realize, you know, it, 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 what level do you want to take it? and step away. And I was like, wow, there's, I don't think I'm going to be happy if I just keep racing my bike. And if I die tomorrow, I want, mm -hmm. I don't want to have any regrets. As part of that, I said, well, if I don't want to have regrets, like they talk about in Die With Zero, you need money to go and enjoy all the things that life has to offer. So I set out on this, on this journey to learn about financial independence. I read over 250 books over the next few years. I actually got an MBA in portfolio management and finance. And I bought my first property at 21 after, kind of long story short, trading in the stock market and doing some different things. But I modeled my strategy after Warren Buffett, which is a value add strategy. So Warren Buffett learned from Ben Graham, Benjamin Graham, and they have a value add strategy. So what a value add strategy is, basically you're buying either a piece of real estate or a business that is stable, that's cash flow positive, and you find ways to improve it. And as you improve it, you're going to create value creation on the back end. And the nice thing about real estate is you have income, you have appreciation, you have great tax benefits as well. Mm -hmm. And I really believe if you want true financial independence, like you can, you can go with the accumulation theory and save a bunch of money and put it in the stock market and hope you don't spend it before you die. Or you can generate enough passive income to cover your expenses. And once you hit that point, you're really free. That's what, <clears throat> sorry, that's what we read in this book of yours. Yeah. Um, and you taught, Absolutely. taught us all about yeah. that. So that's yeah. awesome. Yeah. So I talk about, you know, I really talk about the strategy as it relates to multifamily real estate, but you can apply the same strategy to uh, multifamily apartments, self storage, car washes, or even businesses as well. What about yeah. car washes? Why are they yeah. good? Yeah. So I think this, this kind of goes to a bigger, uh, bigger picture item. So right now we are in kind of the second half of the real estate cycle. So um, my belief is that there's an 18 year real estate cycle and you have two seven year periods that are up periods separated by a, kind of a mid year, a mid cycle slowdown, which we, which we experienced during COVID. Last time we experienced it was around 9-11, you know, to kind of go back about 18 years. And then you have a four year down period, like a four year down cycle. So as you get further along in the cycle, you see things like interest, interest rates start to rise. You mm -hmm. see prices start to rise. So how do you generate enough cash flow when interest rates are rising and prices are rising? And I think a great thing to invest in during these periods are what I would call like operating real estate. So these would be like mobile home parks, mm -hmm. car washes, short-term rentals, senior assisted housing or living. These things are a business that also have real estate attached to them. So you have kind of more levers to pull, Ashley. And a car wash, you know, you have a car wash business, but you also have a lot of equipment, real estate that depreciates, which which keeps those tax benefits that I mentioned earlier that, that real estate has. And so then how does a syndicated deal work specifically? Yeah, so a syndication is, so let's say, let's say I go buy a piece of real estate, right? Mm -hmm. So I go buy a piece of real estate, I sign on the loan, I bring the cash, I, I manage it myself, I do all these things. Like that's, like that's something that everybody can relate to. You just buy a rental house and that, that sort of thing. Um, there are partnerships. So like, let's say you and I partnered and we went and bought a piece of property. So we say, okay, we're gonna both put 50% of the money in. We're gonna do 50% of the work. We're gonna do 50% of the management. That's like a, a, a joint venture mm -hmm. essentially, if you think about that. A syndication is gonna have basically different types uh, or, or individuals that are doing different jobs in the syndication or in the acquisition of the piece of real estate. So you're going to have what are called general partners and what are called limited partners. And I talk about this in my book as well. The general partner essentially is going to go and do the hard work. They're going to go 
they're going to find the property. They're going to do due diligence on the property. They're going to sign their names on the loans if there are loans that they need to sign their names on. They're going to manage the property. They're going to do all that. The limited partners, typically you're going to bring the majority of the capital. Now, the nice thing is, so if you're a high income professional or you don't have the time or expertise to go out and find pieces of real estate, but you want to be a real estate investor, you can join a general partner as a limited partner and get a lot of the benefits. And typically the limit, limited partners are going to get the majority of the initial returns, the initial cash flows of a property. Mm -hmm. And the general partners, just like a business owner, they're going to get paid last. So the limited partners that contribute their capital are typically going to get paid first, and then the general partners are going to get paid more on the back end, and it's typically performance-based as well. Mm -hmm. So it's like a team, right? Mm -hmm. So you have people that, that go and they find these investment opportunities that are out there. The investors come in with their money. And the nice thing is a limited partner, you're limited to basically the capital you invest in terms of your downside risk. Okay. So a limited partner typically doesn't have uh, liability in the property, and they also don't have to sign the loans and do those things. Mm -hmm. yep. So s one part of the group is like sweat equity, yeah. and then the rest is putting in the finances. Exactly, exactly. And look, you can do this. Like it doesn't have to be a syndication. You can go out and say, "Hey, you know, I'm I'm young, Chris. I'm in college, and I don't have enough money, so I can borrow money from a partner. Mm -hmm. I can go find the property. I can manage the property, and we could be partners. And that's a great partnership, right?" If you have more time than money, then find somebody with more money than time mm -hmm. and you can partner with them. That's essentially what a syndication is, but at a, at a much bigger level. And is that what you guys do at Next Level Income Primary? Yeah. So we we started syndicating deals in 2016 mm -hmm. in the multifamily in the apartment space. And then we grew our team. So now we do multifamily, we do self-storage, we do car washes, as you mentioned, we do mobile home parks, and we're about to launch our, our senior housing partnership as oh, well. Oh yeah, that's right. That's yeah. exciting. Yeah. So you say that multifamily is the holy grail. Uh, yeah. Why do you say that? Mm. Yeah, so it's right on the cover of my book here in front of me, right? So um, really what I refer to in the book, and I took, I took this line from Ray Dalio, so he's an investor. Mm -hmm. So Ray Dalio talks about how do you create more return, a better risk-adjusted return. So if you can decrease your risk and increase your return, he said that's the holy grail of investing. And when I found multifamily real estate, what I realized was if you add this to your portfolio, so remember I have a, my MBA was in portfolio management, so we learned about things like the Sharpe ratio, which is basically your risk-adjusted return. And I looked and said, if I add this type of real estate to my portfolio, my returns go up and my risk goes down. Mm -hmm. That's exactly what Ray Dalio was talking about. So while I don't think it's particular just to multifamily real estate, when you look at the demographics behind multifamily real estate, especially when I wrote my book, you had this ability to generate outsized returns and actually decrease the risk of your portfolio. Mm -hmm. And look, Ashley, this is why the smartest money in the world, pension funds, endowments, family offices, hedge funds, they typically invest mm -hmm. 20 to 30% of their capital in income producing properties. Makes sense. Yeah. So Chris, what else? Anything else that you wanna share? Ooh. There's so many things we could, we could talk about. So I think uh, we, we've covered a lot of things. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we talked about a little bit about the book, a lot, a little bit about the course. So look, if you're listening today and you, you're trying to figure out like, what, what's my next step? If you're, if you're just getting started, if you're, if you're not yet accredited, I think you need to go out and figure out a way to generate more capital, find a way to be accredited. The biggest thing here is people say, Chris, what should I invest in? What should I invest in? I want to create some passive income. Well, most people, it's like, oh, you're going to make your first investment. And look, you've been on this journey, Ashley. Mm -hmm. You make that first investment, you get a few hundred bucks a month coming in. That's cool, but it's not going to change your life. Most people can go out and generate more money in their, in their job or their role or their business a lot faster than that passive mm -hmm. income that they're doing. So I think that's step one yeah. if you're not yet accredited. If you're accredited, then go figure out tax strategies, figure out, okay, you know, how do you, how do you improve your tax situation? Because a dollar saved in taxes is a dollar straight to your bottom line. Mm -hmm. While you're doing those things, learn about investments. Listen to shows like Next Level Income Show or podcast. Yeah. You know, read books, figure out different investment opportunities that are out there um, where you could take our course. We have a free trial. So if you check out nextlevelincome.com and click on the course, there's a free trial course mm -hmm. that you can get um, if you're listening today. And then once you're at that point, when you have excess capital coming in, start to put money, in my opinion, 
in income producing investments. And then once you have income that's coming in in a passive manner above your expenses that are going out every month, you're you're essentially free at that point. Yeah. We're not quite there, but we're working toward it. Yeah. <laughs> you guys are you guys are on a roll. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And you've been yeah. so great to work with. So thank, thank you, you, Chris, for being here today. I really yeah. appreciate it. I'm gonna send you this song, Buy Me a Boat. I'm gonna so listen to it on my home today. I think today. it really should be your yeah. theme song. Like to your uh, podcast, you can play it before you start talking. I'll consider that. You might like I'll it that I'll consider much. that, yeah. All right, well, thank you so much, Chris. <laughs> it's been my pleasure. Thanks for yeah. having me. Thanks, you guys, for tuning in. If you're listening to this on a podcast platform, please uh, subscribe, follow us, and leave a review. And if you're watching this on YouTube, please drop a comment below. Any questions that you got for me, for Chris, I know Chris, he'll help me answer your comments. We want to hear from you. Any questions that you got. And remember to make the change you got to step up. Lead with your heart to train your mind and do not negotiate with your body. I'll see you next time. Mm-hmm.